everyone had a good night of rest and also you had time to digest okay some of the things that we've been dealing with all right uh, it's good to see everyone back I know uh, okay quite a few uh, in uniform so this is a day of work all right and um, everyone's back to work <laughs> Isn't it nice to get away and escape from work and then to the, be here? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. But so we're going to make it worth everyone's while. We're going to get into the Word of God and we're going to try to profit as much from the teaching and preaching of God's Word. Okay. And by God's grace, all right, uh, you pray along with me that the Lord will use me to be a help and encouragement to everyone. Okay. And that this will build us up. Now, as we begin, I just want to kind of lay down one, one thought here. That, you know, when you look at Nehemiah, the, um, the priority of Nehemiah was actually in making sure, all right, making sure that the people there, the gates and the walls were the priority, all right, because otherwise, whatever was going on in the city could not, you cannot settle down. All right? Um, things cannot progress, things cannot settle down. So part of the, so the important thing was making sure that they, all that, the walls and the gates that guarded them were in place. Because that was the reason why he mobilized okay, the elders and all that to the work of repairing the walls. Because he says, you see the distress that we're in. Okay? And so, um, when we deal with the subject of contending for the faith, or that, realize the first and foremost priority is actually establishing ourselves, our base, right? our church, building it up, right? so that the foundation is strong, the walls are strong, right? so that they give us protection, the gates are in place, and they are effective, so that... It achieves the goal where everyone now can be in there in security. Okay, because if you're constantly in a state of uh, insecurity, there's anxiety, the distress, it's very hard to deal with day to day things. Okay, yes, there will be dangers out there, there will be other things out there, but the first and foremost thing is that we make sure that our base is strong. Okay, now how do we do, as the New Testament church, how do we deal with the other things outside? The best way is reproduce churches. Okay, I think, I believe, uh, okay, with the cooperation of the people of God and then with the word of God clearly established, it is possible to turn a church around. Okay, otherwise I will not be doing what I'm doing in my church. Okay? It's possible to turn things around. But more importantly, in many cases, it's easier to start right. And the way to do it, and that's why you see even for the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2 was what that says, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see, the emphasis was always on reproduction. Okay? Reproducing other men, all right, and and churches also need to reproduce churches. Strong, okay. If a church is stands on strong doctrine, all right, and on correct biblical principles, we have a responsibility. If we are concerned about contending for the faith, the most effective way of doing this is to reproduce ourselves, reproduce other disciples. Right, reproduce other disciples through the planting of churches. Okay, we have to look at that from, especially from a missionary viewpoint. Why? Because, uh, and as we multiply, all right. Yes, there will be others that will be drawn to. Hey, what is it that you know? Here's what's happening, and you know, with these people, and oh, I want to find out more. I want to hear, Pastor, I want to know more. Can you please tell us what, what is it that you're doing right? Okay? But understand that it's not about who wins the debate. Okay? There will, be, there will be a great many who are actually in the neutral group 
who assume that because there is no other alternative answer, therefore, that must be correct. And unfortunately, that's wrong. Okay? And if we will focus on what we are supposed to be doing, right? we would be actually making, covering more ground and we would be growing internally and also multiplying. Now, I believe out deep down personally that that's the way that we should tackle this. Okay? Along the way, I believe there are those that can be persuaded. How? Not by winning the debate with, you know, Dr. So-and-so, against so-and-so, or whatever, but that that's why I don't actually get into the most debates. It's not worth the time, but the things that I do say, I say it for a reason because there's always a third party that's reading this, all right? And so whatever I say is directed at the silent third party or even a silent majority that may be afraid to take a stand or they're not even sure if they should speak up. But what happens? You use it like a lightning rod to draw, all right, to make contact with others who are like-minded. And then as we do that, I, a lot of times these, these, these become my friends. All right? uh, we have great fellowship, we encourage one another. And uh, for many of them, it's encouraging for them to know that they are not alone. Okay? But uh, we will have to do this God's way. It's not just by trying to form a coalition or a movement. Okay, let the Lord settle those things. Let the Lord direct and bring the right people to us, whatever. But we just keep holding out the light, holding out the truth, right? But most importantly, the best way to preserve it is grounding and establishing that very clearly within our church and then multiplying ourselves everywhere, right? Which means that we need to have more who are willing to go out and start other churches. Okay? Otherwise, you see, I believe New Testament churches, and, and you saw in Acts chapter 8, I believe when Saul brought persecution on everyone, what happened? The New Testament church was affected very greatly, and then they were all scattered everywhere. But then, the scripture tells us, and they went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere. Okay? So, in other words, this is my theory. Okay? You can say it's my opinion, that's fine. All right? But take it a pinch of salt. I believe, therefore, the New Testament churches need to be like cockroaches. You notice how you kill one cockroach and then more show up. You can never wipe them out. I think if there's an all-out nuclear war and most of humanity dies, the cockroaches will still be around. Okay, and there's a reason for that because have you ever tried to clear out your drawer or whatever and you find a, an egg case, you know, where the cockroach will lay the egg case? One egg case has 16 eggs. You kill one, 16 others <laughs> grow up. You see what I'm saying here? And it was the rapid multiplication, the rapid reproduction that makes it hard and hard to stomp them out. Now this was, we see this in history also because where heavy, bitter persecution came on the Bible-believing churches, the Anabaptists and all that throughout Europe, they went everywhere, they scattered everywhere, and as they traveled, now they, they left where they were, they left the village and whatever because it was attacked, it was burned to the ground, you know, the, the members were slaughtered. When they left, they went elsewhere. They brought with them, and like in the case of the Waldenses, they brought their skills with them, their trade with them, and because of that, they could always go to a new town and start their business all over again. They would buy and sell. As they did that, they would always encounter people and the lady of the house and whatever, and then after selling them merchandise and all that, they said, ma'am, I have something even more precious. Would you be interested? Okay, 
And it was very interesting when you look at the, in the during the Middle Ages with the Waldenses, and they were persecuted for a thousand years by Rome. Okay, that under torture, many of them had memorized entire books of the Bible. Okay, the Bibles that they carried were small missionary volumes because why right, you could tuck it under your coat. It's always there, a chain around their neck. They can always bring it out. And people got saved. And the more they were persecuted, the more they scattered, the more the gospel spread throughout Southern Europe. Okay? Today, they are still around, but they're finished as New Testament churches. You know why? The end came because persecution ended. And that was when compromise came in. When churches get comfortable, this is, that is the time, all right? The time of peace, the time of uh, no persecution was always the time of the greatest compromise. Today, many believe, okay, uh, if you go to Italy, you go up to the mountains there, the Waldenses, well, they believe that you can, when you die and go to heaven, uh, you will go to heaven because of your good works. Okay, it's a very, very different gospel today. Okay, but, under persecution, that was when their faith was refined. That was when the doctrine was clearest and strongest. And so you have to realize here that when the fire comes, it is also the fire of uh, refinement, even for the New Testament churches. And do you realize that when persecution came to the church in, in Jerusalem, one reason for that, and, and Stephen was stoned to death, right? Was it was because they had defied and disobeyed the Lord when he said, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and unto the uttermost part of the world. What did they do? They stayed in Jerusalem and they built a huge mega church running 40 to 60,000 members in Jerusalem. By the time Paul was done, uh, sorry, not Paul, I need to be very specific, Saul was done. They emptied out Jerusalem. Only the, a few of the apostles remained there. Everybody else spread out. And that was when we saw the explosive growth of the missionary endeavors of the New Testament church. All right? So we need to learn from the lessons of history also. You see here that those are th situations that as unpleasant as they are and Peter wrote to the, to the believers to tell them you know, about the fiery trials okay? realize this, it's only for a season but those were the times of the greatest growth actually okay? because it will also refine your convictions during those times okay? but today because of the influence in the last century, 20th century Christianity, most are seeking comfort. Okay? We want a carefree life, which God did not promise here at this point. There will be a new heaven, a new earth, and that's the time. Right? But not now. Okay? So, understand, the first part, when we contend, it must begin with us, begin in our churches, Okay, our very foundations and our walls and our gates. Okay, and then we move outwards from there. Right? So we have that means the the responsibility lies on everyone here. That we have to take this seriously in our own lives. How serious are we about the faith? Right? How serious are we about the word of God? Right? How serious are we about all the very basic things? Okay? Even prayer, the ministry of prayer, you know, reproof, right? Uh, you know, being an encouragement to one another. And it's not all just the lovey dovey, emotional, huggy, feely type stuff. There are times that the best expression of love is to take a brother or sister aside when they are not walking right and then to remind them, okay, about what is right. Okay? But do it, of course, with the right spirit, right? With meekness, with love. What do we do? Serve one another. Okay? So, this morning, right? Uh, okay, we've got some time before lunch, so let's do this. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. And I want to do a little quick survey here about the various parables that the Lord actually gave to us. Okay? Parables concerning the kingdom. And um, 
we're going to actually go through this whole chapter. So, so let's all stand and we'll do some. Let's do some reading, and we'll read the first nine verses. All right, we'll do this responsively. So I'll begin. The same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and ate up Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Verse 9, who had ears to hear, let him hear. Our Father, thank you for this uh, morning, for gathering us here. I thank you for each and every one who has sacrificed the time uh, to be here on a working day. And Lord, thank you for giving us a night of rest and uh, for ministering through us through your word over the last few days. I pray, Lord, that you, as you saturate our, our thoughts with uh, the word of God, that um, it will also work in us. And I pray that for tender hearts, willingness, Lord, to consider what you have for us. And then, Lord, I pray that these truths will be impressed on us and, uh, Lord, that it will build us up and strengthen us. Uh, help us, that it will help us also to be vigilant and uh, Lord, have your way with us. Empower me also. Strengthen me. I pray you fill me with thy spirit that I will be able to preach with the power of God and not with the power of men. And we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, Matthew 13 has a series of parables that the Lord Jesus Christ taught to the disciples. And very quickly, the, a parable is a earthly story right but it will have a heavenly or divine meaning okay it is based on things that ordinary everyday things that you and i can understand okay and it will it illustrates this using what the things that we already understand in day-to-day -day life the mechanics the mechanism and all that so that it's easily understood by others okay so now I want us to realize here that um, as we deal with this, that there are a series of parables concerning the kingdom of God that uh, G the Lord Jesus Christ deals with, right? He, the verses that we read was, had to do with the parable of the sower. You look at the parable of the sower, you notice it says here that some, verse 4, it says that as the sower went to sow, right, some seeds fell by the wayside, the fowls came, devoured them out, up, some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth and when they, what happens? When they sprung up, they had no deepness of earth. So when the sun was up, they were scorched and because they had no root, they withered away. Others, what happens? Fell among thorns and then finally there was those that fell on the good ground. Now, this was strange and mysterious to the, uh, to the disciples and so they came to him in verse 10 all right, and he said, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? And he, he answered and said unto them, verse 11, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. So now, some of the parables, in other words, the, they were given to reveal to, truths to those who are believing, but also to obscure or to hide them from the unbelieving. You see what I'm saying here? There was, two, there was a dual purpose. All right. For whosoever had to him shall be given, but he that have more, that, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever had not from him shall be taken away, even that he had. Okay. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not. Okay. There are those that can see, but they cannot see spiritual truth. And hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. 
Okay, and this was a fulfillment of prophecy because verse 14 of Isaiah, in verse 14, Isaiah said this, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. Now, every bit of this has to do with the spiritual condition of the listener. That's why you see the next verse in verse 15, it says, For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. Tired. Pastor, this is tedious. It is tiring. You know, I've heard this before. And, and here this is, and their eyes, they have closed. That was a voluntary choice to shut their eyes. Okay? Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I, shall, I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they here so what you see here is you know our our your the tenderness of your heart right how receptive you are to scriptural truth will determine how much impact or how much influence it will have on you and i here those that are the skeptics the scorners weapons god shuts the truth from them okay totally Sometimes that's why it's frustrating because with certain people, you get to a point where uh, no matter how persuasive you may be with, from the scriptures, they will not hear, they embrace error because they have already shut their ears and their, their eyes. The door to their heart has been closed. All right? Because of that, no matter how much truth you present to them, th that ability to perceive and understand the truth is already taken away. They chose that. Now, he explains this parable, all right? If you go down to verse 18, it says, Now, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. So we're going to deal with the first parable. All right, it says, When anyone hear of the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not. Okay, now, each of these, par uh, in th this parable, he talks about certain things. There's a sower, he sows seed in a field. Now the type of ground has to do with the condition of the heart, the different types of hearts. Here, the first one, he says, when in the first case, when he sows the seed, now which, was the, which one was it? It was the one that was sown by the wayside. All right? It says here that any, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, okay, the gospels presented to them, was given to them, but what happens? There's a failure to understand. Okay, what happens? Then come of the wicked one. So now there was a reference there that the birds came and they took away the seeds. They ate it up. Okay, Jesus explains very clearly who the birds are. He said the wicked one will come. You will see this that sometimes when you deal with someone and you know, they, they will tell you, not now, not now. Maybe later. All right, I'll come to Christ later. Not now, I still have time. However, and you're going to see at, at some point that the conviction goes away. Here, this, this was taken away by the wicked one. It says, and catch up away that which was sown, notice, in his heart. Okay, so we see here that, that um, the whole purpose of preaching the word of the kingdom and the, the gospel all right is to when we present it that god will deal with that person through by way of holy spirit conviction but here the wicked one comes and snatches away takes away that which was already sown in his heart okay now we don't achieve this we uh, this is achieved by what holy spirit conviction it is not achieved by you know very so-called loud emotional preaching where man is the one that will induce some sort of conviction in the person. This has to be from the working of the Holy Spirit. But here, it says, man can resist. Okay, and because they resist weapons, the wicked one comes and then catches away that which was sown in his heart. It says, now, he explains, now, this is he that receives seed, by the way. Now, we're very clear on the first example because this points out to us, this person never got saved. 
But let's look at the second one. But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word and anon, now with joy, receiveth it. Now that word anon talks about Im that this was immediate. There was an immediate response, there was an enthusiastic response, and there was great joy and all that. And what happens? I don't know if you noticed this, that in the, one, in the case of the one that was sown in stony places, there was also an emotional response. Right? This is, what happens? With joy. What happens? Yet, had he not root in himself. Now, remember, he's talking to a group of people who understand farming. Okay, I don't know whether students still do this, but I, I remember when I was uh, in elementary school and uh, in my first year, you know, we planted seeds, right? We, we allowed the seeds to germinate in a little bottle and we would see that there the becomes a seedling, a, a little root comes out, all right? And then it will sprout and then it goes on. But what happens? Eventually it dies. Why? Because unless it is planted into the ground, it, it's not going to grow fully because the seed, provides just enough nourishment f to sustain life for a while and then it's gone. Okay? I used to plant them all the time just to see what happens and it's like, whoa, this is cool, right? Within the next few days, we see all this. Now, what happens is this. Here, it describes an example that where the seed lands on the stony places, right? Verse 21 tells us that he had not root in himself. So what happens? But endure for a while. It endures for a while. Okay? This stony ground we see in verse 5 and verse 6 tells us that you know the, there was not much depth. Okay? That here the ground, the, the, the layer of soil was very thin. But underneath there was rock. When the sun came up, what happens? It cooked the seed. Okay? It sprouted just for a while. And then it says here, the parallel in real life is this, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth. How many of us realize every one of us in our Christian walk is going to face difficulties and trials? Tribulation is going to come. So here it says, when that came or when persecution came, and understand this, no, we, 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 Paul made it very clear, yea, all they that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Persecution doesn't come on only a select few of people or that it came only during a certain age and we're now in a time where there's no persecution. Do you realize that the largest group of persecuted people today are Christians around the world? Just that the media doesn't like reporting about it. Right? But what happens is this, if you live godly in Christ Jesus, if you desire righteousness and holiness, whatever, you are going to face persecution, both from the inside and outside. Why? Because the, from the outside, the world is going to persecute you because if they hated Christ, they will hate you. And they know how to tell. By the way, do you realize the world knows its own? John wrote that in his epistle. The world recognizes their own type, their own kind, even if you're in Christian clothing. They know their own kind. And because they know their own kind, they know when you don't belong to them. You're not part of them. So that's why you have to understand, quit trying to be cool or relevant because you don't fit in and they can tell the difference. Right? But because they can tell the difference, now here comes the thing. I've heard a lot of amens. I heard a lot of people agree. Now, then how say so many Baptists, oh, you can't tell who is saved and who is not. The world can. The world can. The demons can. Demon. Acts chapter 19. Paul I know. Right? What was that one? Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are ye? I saw that first hand three years ago. When a bunch of us of men, we had to deal with someone who was possessed by not one, not two, but many evil spirits. That night we spoke to 10. And they said, the boss is not here. When he comes back, 
we're going to have some fun. That's what the, she told us. One of them who controlled her said, stared right back at her. I'm not afraid of you. And all of us paused for a while because we were like, and we stared right back and said, we're not afraid of you either. And you know what happened? That evil spirit got that woman to smile. And <laughs> Why? Because he knew that was true. The world knows their own. They know who, who is part of them and who is not. The demons know the difference. Only Baptists seem to be the ones who say, we don't know who is saved and who isn't. So sad. Blind Baptists so full of our own philosophy and thinking and our own reasoning, we can't tell the difference anymore. How strange. Now here, it tells us that there was no root. The root could not penetrate the ground because of the rock, the stony ground below. So because of that, when the sun came up, the heat of the sun cooked this seed. Here it says, this was in the form of what? Tribulation and persecution. When all those discomforts come, when trouble comes, it says, what happens? Because of the word. Because of the testimony of the word of God, it said, by and by he is offended. Now, I put it to you, you and I need to beware because some of us here, this is where there is the clear witness of the word of God and there is sound biblical doctrine why are you and I offended? Why? Shouldn't there be great rejoicing when truth is declared? Right? And, when, when, and as a body of Christ we are determined we are resolved we want to obey we want to follow should we not rejoice? Why are we offended? Maybe we need to check ourselves something's wrong. Okay, but here, this is talking about the, the spiritual condition of those who the gospel has been sold. And here, I want to point out one thing. There was no life. It endured for a while, for a short moment. And we are familiar with this because why? Time and time again, someone with great joy and enthusiasm and zeal makes a professional faith, gets saved, whatever, and it was metal time. Six months later, after we baptize them, they're gone. This is what Jesus is talking about. They're gone. I contend, if you look at this, if you understand your plant biology, there was no life. In the long term, no life. But these are always, very often, the most dramatic ones. That's why that word, anon, immediately wow this is great and I want us to realize here the first two cases there was no life John in 1st John chapter 5 tells us that he that had the son had life but Baptists like to leave out the second part and he that hath not the son of God hath not life no eternal life in them is Christ in you Right? The people, we, we ought to be concerned about this because if we want to be faithful in bringing the gospel to others and to evangelize effectively, we have to ask the question, is Christ in that person? If not, we continue to bring the gospel to them, clarify all those issues so that they may be saved. Right? Our goal is what? The same as the Lord. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Right? So, in some cases, th the job's not over. Here, what happens? They walk away, they leave, they whatever. And, you know, many of us become very troubled by this because uh, how is it? You know, before, you know, we were so hot, so on fire for the Lord, and we were always in prayer meetings together. We go this, we we'll do this together, do that. And today, that person's an atheist. Well, is this? Yet had he no root in himself. The root is important. Right? Someone talks about how that he shall be a tree that's planted by the rivers of waters. What happens? Near the source of water, 
Alright, the roots have to go in deep to be able to draw that water that gives life. Alright, what happens? Without that root, you can't, there is no life. Some people can only seem to have life when it's third party. They get their heat from the heat of other believers. But not on their own. Once you leave them on their own, you see it, it fizzles out. It's third party. Kind of like vampires. They need this. And here, this talks about the lack of spiritual life. Why? There is no eternal life. Let's move to the third case. Verse 22. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he the hearer of the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. Now, then look at this last phrase. And he becometh unfruitful. Now, I put it to you that when, when Jesus explained this, this third case is where someone in his life was born again, but what happens was this. Distractions come in. All right, is this the the thorns when you plant something among the thorns you plant something among the weeds what happens there's competition for sunlight there's competition for nutrients from the ground there's competition for water and there are many things that compete with us compete with our heart uh, for, for our heart's attention and here it says there were two two particular categories the deceitfulness of riches and then the care of this world now by the way that represents the two opposite ends one, wealth can distract us. They deceive us. They f deceive us, they fool us, they lie to us into thinking that, you know, we can be satisfied with all this, we are okay. Why? Because when you have wealth, you can buy your way out of a lot of problems. But don't think that, well, okay, I'm the most humble one here because I'm the poorest one. Listen, it says here, the care of this world. There are many people who are always worried. Where are we, how are we going to pay the rent? How are we going to get this? How are we going to get the funds for this? How are we going to... And you know what? It says in both cases on the two ends. It says the cares can distract us. By the way, parents, you can become very distracted with babies and children and diapers and laundry and so on and so forth. The cares of this life can overwhelm us. It can get to a point where it says it chokes the word. Now, in other words, sometimes you and I can come for every conference, we attend all the preaching meetings, whatever. I'm not getting very much out of it. You know why? Because of the condition of your heart. You are now, Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, you're worldly. You know why? You've been distracted by all these other cares. And then it says it chokes the word chokes the word of God, you know what, you're not getting much out of it. Now, as a gardener, what do you do? Can this process be reversed? Yes. How? Remove the weeds. You and I have to remove the weeds in our lives. We, we pluck up the thorns. Right? Take away the distractions in your life. Whether it is the deceitfulness of riches, right? That do you realize sometimes that that promotion and that pay raise may not actually be a good thing? It may come with strings attached, right? Uh, more demands on our time away from the people of God, from the church of God, from you know spending time in the Word of God. You know. Many things. I, I don't blame inanimate objects. Okay? The phone, your tablet, your computer, they're just merely tools. But you can make those things your distraction. That's your choice. Because you set the priorities. Here it says they, it chokes the word, and by and by what happens, you become unfruitful. Now, it didn't say lifeless. You notice that? But you become unfruitful. Now, the only, the only way you can be fruitful in the first place is you must have life. Only living things can bring fruit, bring forth fruit. Okay? But 
Here the issue is about is not about no whether there's fruit or no fruit. Here is the fruitfulness is hindered. There's not much fruit. Look at the second case just now, the one that's planted in the stony ground, there's no fruit. Incapable of producing any fruit. You see, there are those who get very defensive and they, they, they will start to say, oh, Pastor, you're, you're a false teacher, you know, you're teaching work salvation. Now listen, there is a difference between no incapable of producing fruit and producing very little fruit. In the case of, being of the unfruitful one, there is life, but you're not healthy. Spiritually, you're not healthy. You are carnal, you're worldly, You've been distracted by the cares of this life. But you, this can be reversed. Okay? This can be corrected. It can be rebuked. It can be re- reproved. It can be pointed out. The person can be corrected. Now, the person can come under conviction. If they do what is necessary, they can become fruitful. But in the second case, there's nothing you can do. All the preaching... All the teaching, all the counseling will not help at all. Why? There has to be life first. They need to be born again. Okay? So the first two cases, no life. Right? What's the solution? They need to get saved. The third case, there's some life. And sometimes we can get so caught up, so carnal, so caught up with the things of this life, we can live as if we're not saved. I know. Because I've been there. You can become just someone who, you know what, we pat ourselves on the back, we congratulate ourselves, we comfort ourselves saying, well, you know what, got the right kind of haircut, wear the right kind of clothes. I carry the right kind. Thank God, I carry the right kind of King James Bible to church. I attend the right kind of church. We sing the right kind of music, but that's all. That's all. Because everything else in the priority of my life is on something else. I've been there for about nine years. Okay? But the Lord can turn us around. When you change those conditions, when I and my wife found our way into a good church that was starting to, that was teaching and preaching the right things, the Lord used that to convict my heart. The Lord used that to break me and to turn me around. You know, until that time, men, can I say this? My wife fought with me constantly about my self-will my stubbornness the decisions I would make she was not comfortable and because she was not comfortable I fought with her I broke her heart I hurt her in the process but she was right but I was being foolish but you know what happened? When we were in a good church, planted there, rooted there, and we were under the teaching and preaching of God's word, you know what? There were so many things we were hearing for the very first time. The Lord was dealing with me. I gave my heart to the Lord. When I did that, she stopped fighting with me. Why? She now knows that she's married to someone who is surrendered fully to the word of God and to the Holy Spirit of God. There was no need to wrestle with me. Because why? What she was afraid of was this. She was afraid of trusting me when I was doing my own thing. There was no fear when I was following the Lord. We didn't have a problem since then. And men, we have to realize this. Your wife can see something about you. You know, and sometimes she could be very uncomfortable because there is the doubt are you really following the Lord and obeying Him and His will or are you doing it for your own reasons or for your self-will 
And it is the requirement, right, in the scriptures. It is a scriptural requirement that the pastor, for instance, is not to be self-willed. Okay. And here, okay, coming back to this, the, that this, once you remove this, right, all those conditions, right, like I said, it could be things that are happening in your life, your immediate personal circumstances, right, in your home, in your job, whoever, we remove those things, or, and, and then not only that, you're planted in the right place, in the right ground, and that there's a good church, and whatever, where the word of God is being taught properly, systematically, correctly, what happens? There can be great growth. And once there's growth, there's maturity, what happens? I, I had a mango tree that I planted. It took about eight years, and then there was fruit. Okay, we gave, uh, I gave a mango to my grandmother. Two weeks, I think it was a one week or two weeks later, she gave me the seedling. She ate the mango and then she says, hey, this thing is sprouted out. Why don't you plant this? I planted that, watered that daily, took care of that. Eight years later, there was fruit. Fruit will come with maturity. Fruit will come with growth. But here, when growth is hindered, you're not going to see much fruit. On the other hand, when you look at the one that's planted on the stony ground, this, like I said, this is like the plastic plants or flowers. You know what happens? 20 years later, they look exactly the same. Right? You can put a plastic tree in the corner of the, uh, of the front here, but what happens? It will never bear fruit because it is not alive. Okay, now I'm not talking about rocket science. So far, you get what I'm talking about because you see this, right? You, some of you have planted things before, you know that. Some of you have worked on the farm, you know. Some of you are science teachers, you know this. I'm not talking about advanced physics or anything like that. All right? And Jesus explained this in the simplest of terms to the people, all right, to help them to understand these parables. And then let's go to, so let's go to the next one. Verse 23, But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth, some in a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Now, this is not about finances. <laughs> okay? Jesus is not talking about your tithing and your giving, but he's saying here that one who is planted, rooted in Christ, planted into the good ground, weapons, we hear the word, he understands it. All right? The gospel must be understood. Not just heard, but understood. Okay? This is what happens. It will bring, it will bear fruit. It will bring forth a lot of fruit. Sometimes a hundred times, sixty times, thirty times, but there will be fruit. Now, I put it to you that the part of the issue here is also that uh, we've been impatient for results. And because we've been impatient for results, um, what happens is that we're not sometimes waiting to see did God bring forth fruit? Because if God did the work of saving, we're going to see fruit. Okay? We're going to see fruit. Now, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And look at verse 15. We'll start with verse 13 first, all right? This is just for context. Now, Paul warns Timothy about what? That in the, concerning the last days and all that, that perilous time shall come and all, all this and all these dangers. Verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Okay? Can you imagine? It's so bad. People believe their own lies. And there are people like that. Now, it says here, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. All right, through, through Paul. But notice, there is a semicolon there, so it continues into the next verse, and that from a child. Notice, Paul was talk, t telling Timothy, here's the remedy for all this, the perilous times, all, the, you know, all these evil, um, what was that? Evil men and seducers, Right. What was the remedy? It says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Do you realize what is the remedy for all the false teachers, whoever? Genuine salvation. 
by implication, there are many who may stand behind the pulpit, never being saved at all. One of my good friends was like that. For 10 years as a pastor, he was never saved. But you know what happened? What a world of difference it makes when he finally got saved. Everything that he had learned and knew, you know, that spiritual growth was accelerated. Here, I want us to notice something here. It says, and that from a child thou has known the Holy Scriptures. Now, then it says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Do you see here proper understanding is important to lead someone to the cross? Proper understanding. Many times, whether it's an adult or a young child, and Jesus said they, they did not understand the word of the kingdom. Right? They understand it did not. Without proper understanding, now we're not talking about intellectual understanding. We're not talking about mental assent. But there has to be a sufficient point of understanding that they can understand the implications. They can understand that as a lost and wretched sinner, that I have offended a holy and righteous God and I'm in trouble if I were to perish and die. Okay? It says here, the hope was this, grounding them, the children as a child. Timothy was grounded in the holy scriptures. That laid the foundation. It doesn't guarantee his salvation. Then it says, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. Right, parents, so if we lay that foundation faithfully, however, don't rush it. You don't have to push this. Just keep laying that, sowing, watering, and guess what? The day will come when it all comes together. The understanding comes, and oh, now I understand what you're talking about. All right now, I understand. Oh, all these years I've been serving in this ministry, in that ministry, whatever, as a as a young person or as a child in church, whatever. That could not save me. That could not erase the, the stain of sin and the burden and the weight of sin that I've been feeling all these years. Now I understand. Why? Because there is a spiritual wisdom that comes. Okay? But we've been so driven by the, an agenda that we can't see the difference. And many times, what we mistake for a wonderful testimony of salvation was he the receiver of the seed into stony places right verse 20 of Matthew 13 the same is he the hearer of the word and anon with joy receiveth it and yet had he not noticed root in himself you see as, as we were doing a work of evangelism and, and soul winning understand this I want to see right okay someone makes a decision he makes professional faith now I want to see did God do the work of saving is there evidence of life okay now the evidence of life is not the evidence of the works of righteousness it's not the evidence of all the things that this person is doing what we're looking for is is Christ in them because if Christ is in them, if the Holy Spirit is, is moved in and is indwelling someone, you know what? It fundamentally changes their relationship with many things, especially with the Word of God. That's how I knew one of the men, he, he got saved because I had no idea he got saved, to be honest. I thought he was backslidden. Why? Right? Because I was fed the same propaganda that many of us have been fed. Oh, so and so, they got no love for the word of God, no interest, they can't, they fall asleep automatically by magic during all the preaching. Uh, and then they walked out of church, never came back, or whatever. And suddenly, if something happens, oh, that's because they're just backslidden. No, they weren't. They never had life in them. What happened was this I gave a whole lot of scriptures. That man that night, while we were talking, after we were done, sorry, got down on his knees, asked the Lord to save him. I had no idea. I did not know. Within a week, there were changes. Suddenly, all those years begging this person to come to church, this person said, hey, what time do you meet? 
where do I go? During the weekdays, is there a place that you guys hang out? What's going on? And then I came to realize somebody just got saved. And stayed safe and continued. Yes, with ups and downs, but continued on a general trend for the last, I think, 15 or more years. Now, we get caught up or distracted by the one that seems very dramatic. Okay? Without realizing that it's not the real thing. Because the real thing, okay, it's always a gradual, steady progress. My school, it was a Methodist school. Um, I, I remember, I think in my final year, they brought out a poster boy for salvation. Here was the bad boy who is now dramatically, gloriously converted and saved and you know, came up before the whole school body. We had probably at least a thousand students or more and he gave his testimony wherever he went around self-righteously preaching to everybody. Today is a reprobate. A girl that I thought I would spend the rest of my life with, we attended prayer meetings together, went to all the youth meetings together, we would listen, we exchange all the preaching tapes and whatever. We prayed for the salvation of our friends, whatever. Today is a declared atheist. How wrong I was. Guys, ladies, sometimes with our eyes, we, we can be very wrong about somebody. Let's move on to the next parable, verse 24, because then Jesus expands on this, right? Because there are quite a number of parables here. This is now the wheat and the tares. This is another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Right? Now, this is the kingdom of heaven. Is this, uh, it's like a man, he sows good seed, right? Hang on to that phrase, right? Good seed was sown in the field. So, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then had it tares? He said unto them, An enemy had done this. The servants said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest we... Thus while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Okay? Now, verse 36, you see the explanation for this. Right? Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, Right, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto them, He that sows the good seed is the Son of Man. So the explanation is given. The Son of Man sows the good seed. Now, look at verse 38. It's very important. He explains the details. Where is the field? The field is the world. Right? The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. So that's who, two groups of people. Lost and saved. Right? A child of the devil and child of God. Where is that feel? The world. I want to emphasize that. That the feel is explained here very clearly in plain text is the world because many Baptists will insist it's the church. Why? We base it on our experience and then this conveniently explains away why we have so many of the unconverted sitting in the pews. I had one person even literally almost shouting at the, our guest preacher and I until I said, look at 
the verse. Calm down, be quiet, look at this verse. The field is the world. Even if we agree with this, sometimes deep down, we have already ab- accepted that idea. It's normal. That's why they say, you know what? We're not supposed to root up anyone. Do you realize something? This, if that was true, it will contradict other scriptures where the definition of a New Testament church is the assembly of the saints, those who have been set apart, those who have been saved and set apart by Jesus Christ. Yesterday I, I, I mentioned right from First Corinthians chapter three, if any man defile the temple of God, what happens? Him will God destroy. Do you realize you, you can defile that but with an impure, unconverted membership? It's not just merely sexual immorality or some, some gross sin. Okay, we have a responsibility to maintain a pure membership. Can we do it 100% uh, foolproof? No. Even the disciples didn't know that Judas was lost. In fact, he was the most honored member. That's why they made him the treasurer. He was the most trusted one. And even when Jesus identified who would betray him, they said, oh, he left the room, left where they were. It must be because he's going to give money to the poor. They were rationalizing and making excuses for him. Why? Because the Lord can see the inside and it's very hard for us to discern. We can discern things sometimes from the actions, right? from the attitude, but it is never foolproof. It doesn't, however, mean that we abandon all discernment and you know what? It doesn't matter anyone. Whosoever will, let's just baptize. Let's just make them a member and then that's it. Nope. Because that will mean we have to take a lot of scripture and throw it out concerning, in fact, the, the membership of the church. In fact, what was the remedy for this? Okay, it's not foolproof. So what was the remedy? Church discipline. Right? So that we can take corrective measure. Is it Matthew 18? Is it you know, if we will not hear the church, what happens is let him be unto thee as a heathen, as if the person's not saved, until proven otherwise. Right? Even in First Corinthians chapter 5, the one says, well, remove him, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, right? That the, that the spirit might be saved. Why? Because he's not going to lose his salvation, but remove him. Second Corinthians, he repented. They said. Paul said, bring him back, restore him. Okay? So the corrective measure is there even if it's not a foolproof process. Okay? Because this is not about a uh, a methodology or, you know, a certain set of procedures because there are, and I do know of cases where as foolproof as the method may be. Okay? In one case, um, five men and their wives they must have a unanimous vote before they will recommend someone to be a member before the whole church. And the whole church will still de- make a decision. You know what happened? 50% of the members at one point split and went off and they went in a totally different direction even though it was a very, very strict, very stringent method. Okay, so our confidence not just is not in methodology. But realize this, that there is a difference. Here, it says, there are those who are of the wicked one and there are those who are, okay, are children of the kingdom. Now, he answered, verse 37, and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, right, the field, sorry, I'll, I'll skip down to verse 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. Now, What's the difference between the wheat and the test? Now, as you plant that, as they sprout up and they grow, they look almost identical. But when it's time comes, the fruit is different. One does not have fruit, but the other one does. According to ancient Roman law, 
Okay, it is a crime to deliberately to to sow tears in your neighbor's field. Okay, if that was gathered, harvested, and 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 you actually mill that and then use it, it poisons people. Okay, it's toxic. It's actually poisonous. Uh, hang on to that thought here. See, that's interesting, isn't it? It's poisonous. One is fruitful, is nutritious, is nourishing. The other one is poisonous. Maybe that helps us. That helps explain why you know there are some very toxic people in churches. And they, even if they leave weapons, they bring that from church to church to church. I know that to be the case even of some preachers. Okay, there's one I heard, very popular preacher, whatever, they invite him, but he's got a ability, supernatural ability that through the preaching, it always somehow connects with the most bitter person in that church who will later, after this guy is gone, that bitter person will destroy the pastor. And he's left a train wreck of broken churches like that. Because broken churches never report on this because very often they don't no longer exist. Now, here, it tells us, all right, in, they coexist within the world. Okay? But understand this. Not only are they the children of the devil or the, or the wicked one, remember, they look alike. So are we talking about the wicked, wild, people who are into the drugs and alcohol and all that stuff remember they look very similar what does that suggest to you if they look similar to the sheep I contend that there are two versions of Christianity in this world the real one and the fake one one that is lifeless and that has no genuine spiritual fruit. But, you can't, but to the rest of the world, they cannot tell them apart. They look the same. And because they have a different father, those who are the children of the devil or the wicked one are very hostile to the children of the kingdom. That's been, by the way, if you study the trail of blood and you see the chart at the back there, you will see that the fake Christians for the most part of the last 2,000 years persecuted the genuine believers. Look at the chart behind. It's staring at us in the face, but you know, we, because we are so entrenched in our culture and all the other, you know, the whole network of Baptist churches and our, what's happening in our modern day era, we are unable to see the reality even though it's staring at us in the face. And I'm just pointing it out from scripture. Okay? This is the enemy that sold them is the devil. Alright? And I want you to think about this. The good seed always produces the right fruit. That's why the, the, the servants came to the master. He said, didn't you, Master, didn't you sow good seed? Then how is it we got this result? Now, they were correct. Right? The good seed will always produce the right result. And the master said, I did sow good seed. But someone else came along and sowed tears. You see what I'm saying here? And we have to realize, unless we get back to the Word of God and carefully, rightly divide the Word, what happens? There is more than one gospel which produces very different fruit. But the right seed always produces the right fruit. So how do you get, well, you, Pastor, we all want the right results, don't we? How do we do it? You make sure you use the right seed. 
All right? If I plant mang a mango seed, don't expect durian. No matter how, okay? And here's, here's the way we do it. In church, we plant mango seed, we expect durian, so we gather a whole bowl of beer. Yes, you can do it. Don't worry. We will be here. We will encourage you. We stand behind you. We support you. We're praying for you, whoever. But you know what? It's not going to produce durian. Why? Because the fundamental nature is different. And you have to get back to the basics. All right? Until you plant the right seed, you're not going to get the right results. Period. And so, the, and the scriptures clearly define for us what kind of seed it should be. All right? That... What happens in, in preaching the gospel, Paul said he did not shun to give all the counsel of God, right? And he faithfully gave, taught everyone, right? The Jews or the, uh, or the Gentiles from house to house where, that what? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And I dare anyone, you see, repentance is not necessary. Take a big black marker and blot it out from your Bible or tear those pages out. Otherwise, Get back into a proper study and find out what that means instead of what people say it means. Because they redefine it. Okay? Don't get into a straw man argument. Now, what's a straw man argument? I create this fake man out of straw and I punch it down. Ah, I defeated that. You see? That argument could not stand. That's a straw man argument. What does the Bible have to say? What does biblical repentance really mean? Right? But because until you do that, you're not going to get the right result. Okay? And trying to silence everyone in the debate is not going to fix the issue. They will attack, all right? They will attack you, they will mischaracterize you, they will, you know, do all that kind of stuff, but it's not going to change the fact. The fruit, the result speaks for itself. How is it that some churches, and the Bible colleges, and the associated, uh, associated churches and the network have a trend of certain types of sins. The spiritual DNA is the same. That's why. Fornication, adultery, molesting children, stealing money, deception, all sorts of disguise, a false pretense. Okay? Now, yes, the Lord will set, settle this in the end. All right? Because here, it says the reapers are the angels, verse 39, verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and they which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who had ears to hear, let him hear. Now, it's very clear, that's why we, it's not our job to go around executing people who are tears. Why don't we do that? Because every day that somebody is alive, there is still an opportunity for them to get saved. Amen. They are not my enemies. They may make themselves an enemy to me, but our heart's desire ought to be that they can be saved. All right? But the Lord will settle this one day. So when I say that, as long as, you know, we don't root them up because why? We may get the wrong person or whatever. Understand this. We need to bring the gospel to them. We need to plead with them. They may or may not hear initially. 
But if you consistently chip away patiently, what happens? The word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, is able to penetrate. There will be two responses. One, they will accept it, or they will reject it. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 6, you're going to see here that Stephen, sorry, Acts chapter 7, uh, Stephen, he preached this, right? A message when he was confronted by the Jews. And I want to look at verse 51 onwards, okay? He is a, the, chapter 7 is a very long chapter, okay? That was a pretty long sermon that he, he went through the entire history of Israel. He pointed to them that Israel as a nation, their, D, their DNA was that characteristically they were spiritually stubborn. Whether it was during the time of Moses in the wilderness, whether they were in the, when they finally came into the promised land, right, the whole terrible history of the, of the nation of Israel showed the spiritual stubbornness and their rejection. God was very patient and merciful to them. But then he points out a truth in verse 51. Now, I want us to see the spirit of Stephen because here was this deacon who preaches very boldly and yet with a right, right spirit and it was a very fine balance. He was very confrontational. Verse 51, ye stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. What did he say? All the fathers of Israel, all, the, you know, all those uh, in the past, right, and many of them were honored men, whoever it is, they resisted the Holy Ghost. He points out to them here. Remember in his sermon, this is the point he's preparing them for the invitation. He's telling them, look, you're stiff-necked, you're uncircumcised in heart. Right? You, may be unsur you may be circumcised physically as a male Jew. Right? They have removed their foreskin as a, a sign of the symbol of the covenant with the God of Israel. But he says, in your heart and your ears, you're un uncircumcised. He's telling them, you're unconverted. Unbelievers. He says, you're still resisting the Holy Spirit of God. And I said, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? He says, you honor your fathers, but they persecuted the prophets. What was Stephen trying to point out? And you t basically he's saying, and you're telling me they're right with God? I don't think so. He says, and they have slain them with show before of the coming of the just one. Every pro those prophets who prophesied of the coming of Christ, you know what happened? They killed them. Back then. Right? Of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. And then you're, he's telling them, and this generation, you know what happened? You betrayed the just one, referring to Christ, and you murdered him. Wow. That's hard preaching. Right? Is it who have, and all these that they murdered, is it who have received the law by the disposition of angels and is it have not kept it. Now, this is when they look at the response, and when they have heard these things, they were cut to the heart. Conviction. But they rejected that conviction. Notice, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Then look at his response. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven. He's not focused on man. He's focused on the throne of God in heaven. He says, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. You know, the one who ascended up to heaven who was seated at the right hand of God now stood up because why? Stephen was just about to die. Our Lord was looking And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Look at the response. Now, it is our job to be a faithful witness. 
We bring it to everyone. All right. Again, we bring it to those, and in particular, we here. Who did who did Stephen bring this message to? Hmm? Not just the Jews, the ones who claim that they know God, isn't it? Who profess that they know God? What was their response? They were offended. Greatly offended, they gnashed at him at their teeth. They were cut to the heart, and you know something? They were struggling and fighting their conviction. Here, it goes to the next step. They cried out with a loud voice. Why did they cry out with a loud voice? Because many people think that if they can outshout you, they can silence what you're saying. If we have enough people to shout, if we, if we are louder than you, we can s- win the argument. But you cannot silence the conviction that's laid on your conscience. You cannot. You think here that if they were crying out with a loud voice, they cannot hear Stephen. Why did they stop their ears? Why did they cover their ears? They still cannot, they still are hearing that voice of conviction. If I'm shouting, right, I won't be able to hear you. They covered their ears. And ran upon him with one accord because why? If you cannot stop that voice, eventually they will silence the messenger. And they cast and cast him out of the city and stoned him, right, to death. The witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul and they stoned Stephen. But look at Stephen's response. Calling upon God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Right? Stephen is there. Verse 60, and he kneeled down. As he knelt down, he knelt down in the quiet, sure assurance of his salvation, knowing that the Lord will receive his spirit. It's going to be welcome home. Stephen is about to go home. And his prayer was this. Cried with a loud voice not to curse the people who did this but to plead for them. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And every time we see death mentioned with regards to the New Testament saint, it is called sleep. Why? Last night you went to sleep in the sure confidence that you will wake up this morning and you're going to come down, you'll go to work or you're going to come down here. It's temporary. But look at his spirit. He preached boldly. He was not afraid to get in their faces. But many times we get confused. We conflate, right? That contending for the faith, declaring openly and clearly the truth is the same thing as being carnal and contentious. Look at Stephen's example. It was bold, it was clear, it was not mean, it was not hateful. What was, even as he was dying, what was his desire? He says, Lord, don't lay this to their charge. Lay not, he said, this is wrong, this is a sin. But you know what he said? Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. One man stood there at the end of this sermon we look at this sermon and sometimes we say, well, you know, that's not how you should preach. Obviously, nobody got saved there. In fact, everyone started throwing rocks. You know, there was a man standing there, a young man whose name was Saul. That in a few chapters later, uh, what happens? That the Lord Jesus Christ was the one that confronted him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecute us down me? Right, it says it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Anybody try kicking at a duran? It's painful. And he says here, why are you 
kicking, he's angry, he's, you know, he's offended, whatever, and he's trying to silence the voice of conviction that could not go away. He went on a rampage in his madness, destroying church after church. But you know, Saul had to go, whenever he lay down to sleep, that prick of conviction was there. Did not go away. Who was used? Stephen. Ordinary member who was appointed a deacon, a mere servant and waiter at the church, who preached this very bold message. Right? Not with the intent to destroy, but in the hope that all men will be saved. His eyes, when even when they confronted him, his eyes was not set on men. You see, our, our fight is not with people. He fixed his eyes on the Lord, all right, and his throne. But look at the response because we see this response today. Right? There will be people who are cut to the heart. And I'm pretty sure even when if you do if you upload this, there's gonna be some people there who are gonna be out to destroy me. But is it to cut to the heart and then they gnashed on him with their teeth? <sighs> oh, we need to deal with this guy. We need to kill him. They cried out with a loud voice. They want to out shout him and then they stop their ears. We don't want to listen anymore. But you see, there was somebody else in that audience who was listening and he was watching. A young man named Saul, an up and coming young star in the council of the Sanhedrin. As angry, and he consented to Stephen's death, remember? But as angry and offended as he was, that man stood there struggling with his conviction. Everyone there who was offended was fighting their conviction. Right? Stephen said, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Our job is to be faithful. Right? The, the sowing of the good seed is to go everywhere. But the world, in the world that we live in, Jesus prophesied, we are going to end up in a situation, and this is where we are today, where the wheat and the tares grow up side by side. In this world, not in the church. It ought not to be the case in the church. They look the same outwardly. Which is why it's very difficult to judge by the outward appearance. Okay? Now, in fact, that's why one of the things I had to learn the hard way, okay, and our church actually went through that very, in a very pa painful way, was that the danger is very often if you just look for the outward marks of perfection, you're more likely to be wrong. Because that can be faked. Okay? Outward marks of perfection, this looks nice and it will always stay this way. But living things grow and they change and they transform. Alex, I'm pretty sure 20 years ago, your photograph was very different. You look different. We can see the similarities, but you were also different. All right? we, we saw... Okay, Pastor Joel and you know and Sister Maribel, their, their wedding picture. And in Singapore, we, when we looked at it, they said, "Whoa, these two are so cute, so sweet. They look so cute." But as living people, as as they live and they grow as they mature, weapons, they look different. You will see that the real the wheat. As they make progress, they also fall. And one of the mistakes I, I believe that made in ministry is that um, the ones that fall, that instead of encouraging them, helping them to pick up from there and to keep going, what happens? We favor the ones that seem outwardly perfect. And you know what? Over and over again, 
pastors have been consistently wrong. And then their hearts get broken and they're disappointed because that was not the real thing. Okay, then the corrective action is church discipline. Now, when you don't get that right, you know what, it can also hurt the church because when you have a church that is constantly disciplining people out, fatigue will set in. Everyone gets exhausted. After a while, they're like, oh no, not another one. And you know what, it's like, why do we even bother to go soul winning? Why do we even bother to evangelize? It's like, they come in, they go out. They come in, they go out. It's like a fan. It just keeps rotating. And we need to get back to the fundamentals, get it right. Now, one of the sad things that for me personally I saw was this. You know, it says when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth. All right. And then it says they cried out, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord to destroy him. And I got to see this happen in real life. That someone, week after week, one of the young people was under conviction. It's coming forward over and over again, it's struggling. I know the, I know what you're struggling with because the father told me. All right, and it was a very, very serious issue of sin. I knew the answer was clear. This person is under conviction, needs to get saved. Mom would not have it because you see, my boy is in pain. It's coming forward over and over again. Finally, he said, I know the solution. Boy, stop listening. Stop your ears. He is a false teacher. We must destroy him. Which is more important? The salvation of your loved one? So what if, you know, hey brother Alex, maybe, maybe you were the one that led your son to the Lord. Does it matter if, let's say tomorrow, he tells you, you know what? I just got saved. The scripture is very clear. All heaven will rejoice. We're offended because we have turned this thing to an, a personal ego trip. It is every one of our children or whatever happens with them is what? It's another thing that I, another star or medal that I add because why, I'm such a godly parent. Aren't we concerned? We want the real thing. Right? Or we just satisfied that we just want to have pictures because here's the baptism, here's a picture of the certificate, whatever. All right, we have a nice meal and we feast it, but you know, who cares if they actually die and go to hell? It matters, it's important. One of the saddest stories I heard was this. I, I, I met I got to know this pastor and I he, he from what the things that he posted and he said concerning salvation, I knew this guy stood very strong. So I asked him about some question. Then he, he told me he got saved at 27. I said, oh, that's interesting, at 27. I thought it was interesting because he grew up in a pastor's home. Son of a preacher. And I said, okay, you got saved at 27. Now, that's why I said, I asked him, was there any reaction to this? He said, yes. My father... And all my brothers and sisters boycotted the baptism. They refused to attend. They were offended. I said, where were you baptized then? He says, at another church. I said, why? He said, after the baptism, right, they did not go to the church. Later, his father came up to him at a separate occasion and meeting. I said, as far as we were concerned, you were saved and baptized when you were six years old or whatever it was, okay? We do not recognize this baptism. I put it to you, there's spiritual pride there. But this pride is so terrible, so awful, that it has no concern at all for the genuine salvation of even your own child. You see how awful that is? 
And he's the black sheep of the family today. He's a pastor. He's a good man. He's not famous. You know, he's modest, but he stands strong. You know, I, it broke my heart when I heard this. And I want us to realize here, when you look at Acts chapter 7, that the ones who were the most offended were the people that claimed that they knew God. Okay? And so what we're going to see here, even as the wheat and the tares grow up side by side in the world until the Lord comes back, is that there has been, for the last 2,000 years, an ongoing war by the tares against the wheat the goats against the sheep but the goats are the ones in sheep's clothing okay our job is not to fight back and wage a war uh, uh, of defense or whatever but understand this that the through the trail of blood in the last 2000 years of the new testament churches the evidence is there over and over again that the churches and those who believe that they know God and they know Jesus Christ murdered the saints. This is not something that even when you go into a good fundamental conservative Bible-believing Baptist church that they teach in church history. It's there. We don't want to acknowledge it. But because of that, now how do we deal with the so-called enemy? They made themselves enemies to us. How do we deal with that? That's how we look at Acts chapter 7. What happened? The enemy, one stood there, Saul. Through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, was converted. All right. How do we eliminate the enemy? One soul at a time. Not with a sword. What? Through conversion. Through the Middle Ages, what happened? Over and over again, those that saw the persecuted believers being tortured, even as they were dying, you know what? smote the hearts of many others the more believers died the more converts there were they could not stomp it out that's why with the Waldensies back in the earlier year, centuries what happened was this it drove Rome crazy that the more they more villages churches that they destroyed the more the gospel spread They tried to burn all the books. Very few Waldensian books exist today. But the only time they were ever effective in neutralizing this danger, this threat, was when persecution stopped and churches got soft and comfortable and compromise set in. You see why we need to stay strong and content? Why? Is to establish it I'll, I'll end with this picture it is like this it is not about fighting what's outside that's not the focus or the emphasis but think about it this way if you contend for the faith it's like blowing up a balloon alright you inflate it you <laughs> you blow it up the problem is this this has to be maintained because if you don't it gets, it deflates. And this is about what? To keep things going, we have to maintain this. Just as our faith, our doctrine, our practice, it is something to be maintained. I know that in our day and age today, we're like, Pastor, why is this necessary? Can't we all just talk about the love of Jesus, all right? the love of God, but remember what Jude wrote in verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you, notice, 
of the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Right? So it's a settled faith. It was once delivered. During Jude's time, it was already settled. There's no new doctrines, new teachings, and new discoveries. It's all settled. But notice something here. You know? What Jude was saying is, actually, originally, he wanted to write to them about what? Actually, something much softer. He says, to write to you of the common salvation. It's a joy to talk about the common salvation. All right? It's comforting. But you know something? Jude said it was more needful more important for him to deal with the fact that there was a need to contend. Right? We all like to come together and talk about the love of Jesus and the, you know, the, the sweetness of the comfort of the assurance of the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the goodness of the Lord. We all, want, we all would like to do that. But understand this, you and I can do that all the time whenever we read the scriptures, but there are also other even more important things. And so that was why Jude said, you know what, it was needful for me to write unto you since instead of the other stuff. Right? And today, for some of us, we may need to have a very fundamental shift in our mindset to realize we, do you realize we have been in the last days for the last 2,000 years? Okay? So it's not like, well, that's in the future, it's going to come. We are already there. Therefore, we have to take these things very seriously because it characterizes the times that we live in. Okay? But don't get confused that contending for the faith means that you are carnal and you are contentious. That's a very different thing. Stephen, you know what? He maintained a sweet spirit right to the end, even though people were taking big rocks right up there and they were trying to stone him. He pleaded for them that the Lord would not hold this against them. That, why? Because he desires for all men to be saved. Because of that, one man, he didn't look like he was successful at all. Right? But only one person was convicted in the right way. Time, some time later, was converted. Saul of Tarsus, who then went on to establish many churches, wrote much of the New Testament, recorded that for us. Who gets the credit? You know, if we will go trace it all back, you know, if Stephen didn't die and do that and die, Saul wouldn't have been convicted. It took years ago, you, most of us have heard of uh, D.L. Moody. It was a Sunday school teacher, ordinary Sunday school teacher, which most people don't even remember his name. All right? who, in speaking to D.L. Moody, gave him the gospel. And he got saved. And because of that, he went on to preach to many, and many others got saved. Ask yourself, in the average Baptist church, who would have been given the award for the best soul winner? Nobody will remember that, that man. And yet, understand this, each and every one of us, you know, even if it was one person, you know, God could use that one person and, you know, make a huge difference. All right? But as we close here, understand, there is a difference between true and false conversion. Yes, only the Lord will know for sure at the end, the angels will be able to select and separate them out but what we're going to see also is that when you search the scriptures, there are also scriptural tests and proofs and evidence all right, that will characterize a person who is saved and versus a person who is not. So one of the greatest errors in our day and age 
is the teaching among Baptists, they say, and this is, a, by the way, is to cover up and to silence all debate. It is to say that, well, nobody knows for sure who is or who is not saved. Now, there are two meanings to that statement. Why? Because one way of saying it is, actually means this, nobody can know 100% for sure. All right? But scriptural, the scriptural response to that is, but there are a number of scriptural tests that are given to us. The other way of saying it, and this is the most common understood interpretation, is nobody knows at all. Therefore, no test is necessary, whether for membership or baptism. If that's the case, how do you know that the one we ordain and send out or the or we ordain and who becomes a pastor is even saved? They say we don't know. If you say you don't know, then by logical extension, how do you know when to stop evangelizing and when to start discipling, preparing them for baptism and membership? You say you don't know. Isn't it? If you say you don't know, then how do you know who to evangelize? Hmm? But then the scripture says that the world knows their own. <laughs> so it seems like the moment we come, become members of a church, it's like we become actually dumber than the world. We are unable to see. Do you see that this kind of thing is so full of logical contradictions? that it makes no biblical sense. And what you're saying is, drop all discernment, bring the walls down, br get rid of the door of entry. Because it doesn't matter. What I see instead in the scriptures is that, yes, there are scriptural tests. We have to be discerning. It is not going to cover 100% of all cases we're not always going to get it 100% correct but the church has many things that we can do to fix that problem and to keep refining that right? to take corrective action but over and over again every one of these measures most Baptist churches have dropped them that's why there's hardly any church discipline and if there is, it's always in, done in anger. Okay? I want us to realize here that so much of the very basics, beginning even with just evangelism and seeding the gospel and moving forward from there, has eroded away because of the teachings of men. And because of that, we are ignoring even because of those teachings, those teachings now influence the way we look at the, these passages. All right? And we change that. So there is a lot of work actually for all of us to do because we really need to get back in and study and dig in. And I, I, up to this point, I have not given you anything difficult. It's just that these things sometimes are staring at us in the face, but we fail to recognize it. All right? So I want to call everyone, you know, we need to return back to all the basics and to the truth, right? But we need to be very careful with the details. Okay, otherwise you cannot build a strong church. Okay, and we continue to maintain the right spirit because we're not at war with people. Our job is not to kill all the infidels. Our job is to ensure that we can reach everyone that they might be safe. And if, is there, if they think that they should turn on us hostility or even to kill us, that's their accountability to God. It's not our problem. Right? But we do our part. But because of this, even realize even the evil that Saul or Tarsus brought upon the New Testament church actually led to everyone going everywhere preaching the word. It actually... You know, you can't break or defeat what God wants to do. All the evil of the world cannot defeat God's plan. Right? But we want to make sure that we are part of 
His plan and we are helping to fulfill that. Right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Lord, Lord for